in advance for your engagement. And with that, I'm going to introduce Alana. Alana is the outreach manager for Friends of the Forest Preserves. She wears many hats, but her favorite role is event planner for Beer in the Woods. After working in the wine and beverage industry for over a decade, she loves being able to combine her passions for wine and beer with her environmental work and bringing communities together. So I will let you take it away, Alana. Thank you so much. Um, well, welcome to Ruth and June. Um, thank you both for coming and, and thank you, Nick. Thank you, Christina from Maplewood. Um, yes, feel free to uh, turn your camera on, but as Nick said, you don't mind staying muted. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. So I'm just going to talk very briefly about Friends of the Forest Preserves and the Forest Preserves in general. So here's our virtual lineup, real quick pitch. Tonight, we've got uh, Maplewood Brewery and Distillery. We do have four more nights of amazing programs. So uh, be sure to register for the rest of programs. Um, you should have gotten a confirmation email with the registration links to each of these. And then of course, on Saturday, we have the fifth annual Beer in the Woods at Labaw Woods. So Friends of the Forest Preserves, unites people to protect, promote, and care for the forest preserves in Cook County. And why do we do this? Well, there are 70,000 acres of forest preserves in Cook County. That's 11% of the county. So we are the largest and oldest district of its kind in the nation. We are even older than the National Park Service, which was founded in 1916, and the forest preserves of Cook County were founded in 1914. So another reason why we want to protect and care for the forest preserves is because there's an incredible amount of biodiversity here. Cook County is the most ecologically diverse county in Illinois. So home to hundreds of species of plants and animals, many of which are rare and endangered and many of which call the forest preserves home. So when we talk about these habitats, we're talking about woodlands, savannas, wetlands and prairies. Sometimes when people hear forest preserves, they think about more of the woodlands and these heavily wooded areas. But actually, um, we are, like I said, incredibly diverse. So we have very wet areas. And we have these savannas and prairies, which are actually um, very sparsely dappled with trees and um, yet still incredibly teeming with life. So how do we protect and care for the forest preserves? We do this by uh, employing many, uh, we have, by employing conservation core crews, we have a robust conservation core program. So we hire both youth and adults, many of whom work year round doing hands-on restoration work. So they are removing invasive species, they are gathering native seeds and planting native seeds and native shrubs throughout the county. We also help organize thousands of volunteers across the county. So we help to support their voyage um, to become stewards of the land. And together, oftentimes with our conservation corps, they work to do this restoration work. Now, I've talked a little bit about the how, I'll talk about the why. Why do we want to care and protect the uh, care for and protect the forest preserves. Um, well, we want to promote all of the amazing things that the forest preserves offer. The forest preserves are great for relaxation, for education, and frankly, for inspiration. They're beautiful. Um, they have hundreds of miles of trails. So Friends of the Forest Preserves um, actually runs dozens of free events throughout the year, everything from biking events, birding events, canoeing, kayaking, um, you name it, we've done it, and they're all free. So I will say that Beer in the Woods is one of only two exceptions where we do charge a fee because this is our major fundraiser of the year. So thank you for purchasing tickets and for coming and joining us at Beer in the Woods. And now, without further ado, thank you, Nick and Christina. I'll pass it back to you so we can get started with the tasting. All right, thank you. Um, 
And so I want to introduce our first Beer in the Woods virtual festival partner. Uh, Christina is here with us from Maplewood Brewing. We are in for a real treat. Uh, Christina has been in the beverage industry for the past five years, working from small batch craft spirits to worldwide distributed beer, and now bridges the gap at brewery and distillery Maplewood. You can find Christina sipping on craft cocktails and tending to her succulents and cactus planters in upcycled beer cans that she calls suds and succulents. She loves her dog, Legs, and her fiance, Bobby. Here's Christina. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nick and Alana. We're very appreciative to be a part of the virtual programming at Beer in the Woods, uh, and we're very stoked that you guys have tuned in with us today. Uh, I'm going to start a little bit about the origin of Maplewood. Um, if you guys have heard of us before, or even if you haven't, we are one of the many, many small craft breweries within the city of Chicago. Uh, we opened our doors in 2014 and we have four co-owner co-founders. Uh, now how they got into beer, it's a funny story. Uh, now it's four guys, two of which are brothers uh, and our head brewer, Adam Seaslack, our head distiller, Ari McGallis, uh, were best friends growing up. They really grew up together. Uh, and they grew up, you know, going to Goose Island on Clybourne and, and drinking the beers and getting really immersed in the local craft beer culture. And of course, like many at the time, the early 2000s, even late 90s, they thought to themselves, hey, we can do this. We can totally start our own brewery. But then upon thinking about it, they were like, ah, you know, there's so many of them out there. It's a little saturated. Maybe let's start with spirits. Let's start a craft distillery here in Chicago, which at the time was pretty sparse. Um, craft distilling in Chicago was illegal up until about 2013, 2012. Uh, but they thought, you know what? The equipment is similar between brewing beer and brewing spirits. Let's just try it. And lucky enough at the time, a lot of legislation within uh, the city of Chicago and the city of Illinois what has been changing and we're allowing for small craft distilleries to then open up. They thought, you know what, let's do them both, double or nothing, beer and spirits at the same time. Now, if you're familiar with Maplewood, you might only know the beer side of it, uh, but we did start with distilling spirits at the same time in 2014. Uh, we have a range of single malt whiskeys as well as a spruce gin, and we just came out with some canned cocktails uh, that you can find all around Chicago. I'm actually sipping on one now. Um, I want to show you <laughs> since I have it. We're going to be talking about beer mostly, but uh, these are some of our new canned cocktails. Uh, this is what we call the Palmer Square, uh, kind of an ode to our neighborhood in Logan Square, ode to Palmer Square Park. Uh, it is an Arnold Palmer cocktail, but uh, with our spruce gin. So uh, these come in 12 ounce cans. They're really nice, especially over ice. Highly recommend. <laughs> um, but let's get back to the beer. So our space is at 2717 North Maplewood Avenue. Uh, we're right off Maplewood and Diversity between Western Avenue and the highway. We're tucked in a little kind of side street right by Coyote Logistics. It's a little hard to find sometimes, but we're down there. Uh, one of our new neighbors just opened up a couple months ago, Ravinia Brewing, opened their uh, Logan Square Chicago location right around the corner from us. So it's a good opportunity to do a little bit of brewery hopping if you have the means to, uh, it's right there. So we opened up, we have what we call our lounge. It's a beer tap room plus a cocktail lounge. And I'd encourage you guys, if you're in the area, we're able to come by. We do have a little bit of parking um, on Maplewood to come and check us out and check out the other craft breweries in our area. Uh, the building here, since I am mobile with my phone, I'm gonna kind of show you a little bit more of our space here. Uh, let's see, let's start over here. So this is our brew house at our facility. Uh, this is the only facility for Maplewood currently. Uh, we have outgrown the space in the first year of production back in 2015. We're looking for a second larger space, of course, in the city of Chicago. It's very difficult to get what we need at the time for production, but we do have our 10 barrel brew house right behind me here. Uh, that we brew all of our limited special kind of small batch brews on. Um, it's really kind of working overtime all the time for us. Uh, on the other side, this is kind of fun. Uh, we have our cellar. This is our fermentation row. All of our fermenters are right here behind me. 
Uh, we have a combination of 20 and 30 barrel fermenters, which means we can do a few turns in our brew house when filling up the fermenters, depending on how big our batch is. Let's see here. We have some Christina, of these cool barrels. Oh yeah. I just wanted to interject that I love the smell of a brewery. And so I'm so <laughs> jealous that you're standing there. I mean, can you tell us a little bit about the aromas that you're smelling? Oh yeah, definitely you get that nice grain. You get a little bit of sweetness too. Uh, we have a little bit of the fermentation kind of like um, overflowing a little bit in buckets over here. So you always get a little bit of a sweetness with the grain smell. Um, of course, we're gonna have a little bit of humming noises from all the machinery, um, but I also really enjoy the smell. And you can really tell what we're brewing depending on the day. Uh, I like when we're doing, you know, more of the dark stouts or porters because you're getting a lot of those roasty smells. Um, and a lot of times people think, oh, I kind of taste coffee in my beer. There's probably coffee in it. And a lot of times it's not actual coffee, even though sometimes it is. Um, but those roasted malts really give off that type of similar flavor to roasted coffee beans. Uh, so I really like those days when it kind of smells like those roastiness um, or the sour days because you come in, you're like, something's a little funky, like something's going on here. And that's definitely from all the, you know, the Britannomyces, the Lactobacillus, all that nice souring agents that we use in our beers. So I definitely feel very grateful to be within the smells right now, <laughs> for sure. Oh man. Oh, so I love barrels. You'll find that, you know, very, very, um, kind of offhand with me. I love talking about barrels and wood. So these giant barrels just right, uh, uh, right here. Uh, these are fooders. Uh, fooders are just giant barrels. Uh, you can find fooders a lot of times in wine making facilities. Um, fooders are different from whiskey barrels or a lot of barrels are meant to age beers like stout and porters, mostly because, oh, it's F-O-E-D-E-R. Like fodder, but it's fooder. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank um, you. Yes, of course. It's nice. I can see the chats come up. So I'm like, yes, I can get that. <laughs> <laughs> so the big difference between the fooders and regular whiskey barrels, in addition to the size, is going to be what's on the inside. So whiskey barrels are primarily charred. So there's a heavy char, more light, medium to a heavy char on the inside, which means they construct the barrel, they set it on fire and then they put the controlled flame out and you're able to get really smoky and woody notes from that char inside. But with the fooders, most of the time they're toasted. So it's a lot lighter on the flame you're gonna get inside. And it's really popular for aging or, you know, kind of wanting to get additional flavors with sour beers or farmhouse or saisons. So we have four fooders in our facility uh, that is part of our sour and farmhouse series. We have Flanders Red that's in there. That's going pretty good. Uh, we have a couple kind of experimental things that we've been kind of adding beer to throughout the years. Uh, but I always like to kind of say like, what's in there? I'm like, well, there's a lot of different things in there for sure. Christina, um, yeah. question. Um, and forgive me if you said this and I just didn't catch it, but in one of those big fooders, like, how how much beer does that make like in terms of kegs or cans or like what 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 is that really a lot uh, <laughs> <laughs> um i don't have uh exact barrelage maybe ari knows ari here is one of our co-founder co-owners who's our head distiller he can't hear you guys because it's in my my pods but we're asking <laughs> about the barrelage of the fooders how big are the fooders so that one's a 30 barrel 30 right here. So that, like I said, 20 barrel. With 20. A, with a cone that we use for like uh, fruiting. With a cone for fruiting. And then there's another 30 barrel behind it. And there's another 30 behind it. So 30, 30, and 20? Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's a lot of beer. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, I can show you. So we talked about the fruiters for the sour program, but let's talk about the barrels for our beer aging program, which are right here. So these are gonna be used whiskey barrels, mostly from Maker's Mark, Buffalo Trace, Woodford Reserve, things like that, that we're primarily using to age our uh, barley wine. 
and our barrel aged cuppa series, Imperial Stout. So those are all kind of sleeping back here right now. Question. Um, yes. June wants to know how many bottles do you get from those barrels? The small ones here? I think so, yeah. So, again with the math. So these are 53 gallons. There's a standard industry size for whiskey barrels. And then we don't bottle, we only can. So we, we primarily do 16 ounce cans for the beers. So how many ounces in a gallon? I, I'm sorry for making you do math. <laughs> a lot, that's my, that's my other <laughs> Actually, not a lot, um, honestly. And those are actually the only barrels that we have for the Stout Barrel Aging Program. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> um, but if you do want to do some math, so 53 gallons, we are going to get a little bit of evaporation there from the beer just because it's natural, it's wood. Um, but it's not going to be as much as, say, if you put a spirit in the barrel and then lose angel shares from that and the evaporation for the spirit. It's much higher proof and much higher alcohol. But for the beer, uh, you're gonna, it's going to be a second or third use. So you're going to get a pretty good yield on what you put in um, over that time. Hmm. Okay, I got to show you one more thing and then we'll drink. Okay, maybe two more things. <laughs> so we are a distillery. So this is our still. It's the only still that we have and we make all our spirits on this. Very similar to making beer, except after fermentation, instead of filtering and packaging, we then boil that fermented mash in the still and we condense the alcohol, liquid alcohol in that wort into a vapor, it rises up this column and then it condenses at the top and turns back into a liquid. So you're stripping that like raw alcohol out of the beer, pretty much the beer wash and making it into a spirit. So cool. Okay. And then, oh, it might be a little dark here. Oh gosh, these are the barrels that we actually age our spirits in. So they're much smaller than the 53 gallon. They're only about 15. We might have a couple 30s, um, but we do keep them in here for minimum of two years for most of our whiskeys. Uh, and that's all we got right now. There's a few of them filled with our bourbon run, our first ever bourbon run that we're not gonna see for a little while. So just forget I told you about that. Okay, we're going back to the table. Let's talk about beer. So uh, all the beer that we're gonna be tasting today uh, with me are going to be readily available in the Chicagoland area. Uh, they're gonna be our core four and a special one that we just released last week. Uh, we do not have plans for a non-alcoholic beer at this time, but who knows? Uh, you know, it's uh, better late than never, you know? So. I haven't heard any mumblings about it yet, uh, but we, you know, might be coming up in the next production meeting. Who knows, but I don't know. I know the canned cocktails are kind of the newest product right now, and uh, we'll see where we go from there. But NA is definitely where everyone's going right now. All right, and you can taste along with me, or if you don't have these beers, definitely if you want to take some notes or just, you know, observe, you can find these all in the Chicagoland area uh, and some of them in other states. We're currently distributed uh, to five states. There's Illinois, Wisconsin, Indiana, Kansas, and Missouri. And we're hoping to get into Michigan and Minnesota pretty soon too. Those are tough beer markets, you know, Michigan and Minnesota. Ooh. So we're going to try a uh, right? Oh my gosh. We're going to start with our charlatan. Uh, charlatan is kind of our baby. It's the first beer we ever put in bottles when we first opened up. It is an American Pale Ale, APA, which is different than an IPA. Uh, the APA is not going to be as piney or resiny um, on the nose and the taste there. This is going to be a little bit more citrusy. And what's nice about most of our cans is that we give you actually the grain the grain bill, the hops, and some other vital information on the back of the can if you guys have it. So we have the grains that we use, Turo, Light Munich, Dexatrin, Caramel, and White Wheat. Uh, hops are Citra, Simcoe, Centennial, and Warrior. Um, it's a pale ale, 35 IBUs, which is the international bittering units. 
Um, seven SRM, 6.1% alcohol, one pint of beer. I'm not gonna do it for all of them, but that's where you can find it on the back. Again, not every can has it, but some of them do. Um, Charlatan has a little guy on it with a little monocle and a top hat. Um, the kind of origin of uh, a charlatan is like, um, like a snake oil salesman, like somebody that kind of like wants to kind of get your attention, right? So this is kind of our way of getting your attention for, to us. Um, you can taste it similar to wine and other spirits too. Look at the color. You can look at the head on the bubbles there too. It lets you know how much kind of carbonation's in it. Um, this is a very clear beer, not going to be a hazy at all. I always like to start with Charlatan just because it, he really kind of has been with us since the beginning. He's also won two medals at the Great American Beer Festival in the Pale Ale category. So we're pretty excited about that. Get the nose. You're definitely going to have some hot bite to it, but a lot of citrus notes too. And again, this is 6.1%. So it's not overboard by any means, but you're going to get um, definitely a lot of flavor in it. The kind of big kind of punch of a little bit orange, other citrus notes, a little bit of stone fruit. Oh, oh that's nice. You can also use beer in cocktails. I don't know if you guys do that normally or regularly, um, our liquor license here at our lounge only allows us to serve what we make in our production space. So our bartenders and the lounge staff have a really nice kind of creative element to what they do to create cocktails with what they have around. Um, and quite a few of our cocktails and frozen cocktails um, also include some of our beer. Um, Charlton's a good one to use for sure. Ah, yum, yum, yum. Okay, moving on. You might be familiar with this beer already. Uh, this is our unofficial, official flagship beer. It is our best seller. It comes in this purplish, pinkish can and it's called Son of Juice. Son of Juice. Now, Son of Juice is going to be a hazy IPA. So you're gonna get a little bit difference in the color and clarity on this beer a smidge higher in alcohol than charlatan. It's gonna be 6.3%. So if you see here, the clear, it's not clear. It's gonna be that cloudy mm -hmm. and that's intentional. Um, a lot of times if you don't do like a hard filter on a beer, depending on the style, it's going to actually um, include some of those nice aromatics, and uh, dare I say terpenes that are kind of found in the beer that sometimes gets filtered out in the filtration process. Um, hazy beers are very popular and have been for the last you know, five to seven years, maybe longer. Uh, you might think New England style, things like that. Uh, this definitely isn't as chalky, isn't as um, you know, heavy hitting as those, hmm. but our brewer, our lead brewer of special projects is from Massachusetts. So maybe that is a little bit for it. So definitely get on the nose. You're definitely gonna get a lot of the hops in here. Let's see, what, we, what do we have in here? We have mosaic. Oh, that definitely smells like a mosaic if you guys know hops. Uh, Simcoe, Nugget, and Warrior. <laughs> Yum. Those just sound like nonsense names. Where, like, <laughs> who makes these hops? Yeah, so it's actually like, um, like there's a whole naming process. So. If you, uh, you know, at this time, it's a lot of like blending together. It's a lot of like cross breeding on the hops. Um, and they usually, uh, when they get kind of into the system, they have like a number like H264 or something. Um, I'm not exactly sure who gets a responsibility for naming it. I assume it's going to be kind of that home brewery or that home hop farmer um, that has uh, made that kind of blend and that new uh, style or that new, um, you know, just type of hop. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, there's, just, there's so many. The most popular are the sea hops, which is Citra, Centennial. Um, people also say Simcoe, even though Simcoe starts with an S, but they kind <laughs> of include that in there with the sea hops. Um, 
that are going to be kind of the uh, oh Chinook too. Chinook is very popular, especially for West Coast style IPAs. Um, yeah, isn't that fun though, Warrior? Ooh, what's the question? So Ruth says there are farmers uh, who specialize in hops for beer. Is that a thing? Absolutely. So a fun fact, Yakima Valley, which is located in Eastern Washington state, supplies 90% of the world's hops. Whoa. <laughs> that industry is huge out there. And you know what? The soil is really good for it. Um, if you've been to central or eastern Washington, there's not a lot out there. No offense. I lived in Seattle. I drove through it. <laughs> My mom lives in Spokane. That's about as far west as I've been. Totally, totally. Spokane's all right. Spokane's all right. But that's kind of on the cusp of kind of getting to eastern Washington. Um, the soil is just really kind of nitty gritty. So it works really well for growing hops. And so there are huge companies that are only hop farmers. They only grow hops for breweries um, and how hops grow. It's really fun. If you ever have the chance to go out to Yakima or go to a different hop farm, I know Michigan has some hop farms too. Yes, it's partly because the soil is volcanic. Yes, it has all those good nutrients, almost kind of like starting new and starting fresh from that. Yes, that's that awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> yes. Um, so how hops grow, so they actually grow on a vine, which sounds like vine, like a V, but it's actually a B. It grows in the vine, so it actually grows up kind of like a vining plant, but they call it a vine. Um, and what they do when they harvest it is they take machines or humans, they shake the vine it's on and the hops then fall off and they collect it because you want the whole cone. I don't have any fresh hops here, unfortunately. Uh, we're actually not making a fresh hop, wet hopped beer this year, um, but we do have hop pellets, which is what all breweries use for the remainder of the year outside of late August to mid September, which is the hop harvest for everybody. Um, yeah, hops are cool, you guys. Super cool. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on. We're actually going to go with our Pilsner now. We started with some pale ales. Now we're going to kind of like refresh your palate with the Pulaski Pils. Uh, comes in a red can here with an eagle on it. Uh, the image on the back has the Pulaski train line as well, if you guys are familiar in Chicago. So this is a lager. Uh, every beer on planet earth there's only two types there's ales and there's lagers so ipas apas are all ales pilsners like this is our lagers uh lagers are cold and bottom fermenting and they take a lot longer to ferment so that's what gives them a little bit of a lighter kind of crispy note to it versus the big citrus um kind of bombshells that a lot of pale ales have especially ipas so we're gonna pour this Pils Pulaski. Now we call this our Chicago dry hopped Pilsner. Um, you can see a lot of more dry hopped Pilsners out and about in the craft scene. Uh, dry hopped only means that the uh, there's been hops added in a secondary way during the fermentation process. So basically dry hopped, hopped again, right? It's additional hopping. So in these fermenters, what happens is when we're ready to dry hop, the guys get on this big ladder. We go to the top of the fermenter. We have to close all the garage doors in there not to get any um, type of um, contamination. And then they dose the hops. So they drop the hops right into the fermenter and it adds just another additional kind of like, um, <laughs> twice baked potato. Yeah, I mean, you can have it like that. Yeah. It's Midwest, we gotta, we gotta bring it in. <laughs> totally, totally. Oh, food, I'm hungry. So. Pilsner is going to smell very different from the pale ales. You're not going to get those big citrus notes. You're going to get almost like baked bread. You're going to have a little bit yeah. of a breadiness, a little bit of a grainy, more grain than the ales do. And you're going to get that clarity, just like the Charlatan APA. You're going to get a lot of clear in this as well for this Pilsner. Uh, this is not a traditional Czech style Pilsner. This is kind of like our version, kind of a little bit more of a hot bite Pilsner in Pulaski. And this is going to be 5.1% ABV. Oh, just so refreshing. So refreshing. I love to do this between the hoppy stuff 
going into the dark stuff. So a lot of times people start with the lighter beers and then go to dark. That's not necessarily, you know, necessary for this. Uh, Christina, question. Um, since it has a bread smell, are different yeasts involved? Absolutely. So hops are important, but what's even more important is the yeast. So with the different types of beers being ales and lagers, there's different yeast strains that act differently with the grain and with the hops. So ale yeast is going to be a little bit more active. So it's going to really eat up those fermentable sugars. It's going to create those CO2, that alcohol, and it's going to really kind of um, uh, really go hand in hand with those hoppy flavors, having the hops be kind of the heart of it and the grain being secondary. With things like pilsers and lagers, it's going to be an entirely different strain of yeast. Now with that strain, there's all different types you can get depending on the, the um, aroma and the taste that you're going for. So like I mentioned, it's bottom fermenting, it's cold fermenting, so it takes a longer time to complete. Uh, so on average, ales will take between maybe seven to 14, 18 days to ferment. And that's from the brew house in fermentation and then you package after that. Uh, for ale, or for lagers rather, like the Pilsners, that can take anywhere from 25 to 60 days, depending on the batch, depending on the ingredients and depending on the yeast strain. Yeast, so important. Uh, we work a lot with a local uh, yeast provider here in Chicago called Omega. Uh, they actually have a fabulous facility you can go to and take tours of the yeast facility. And it's so silly to talk about and mention, but it's so integral to beer. And so they have their own brewing facility right when you walk in, but they're testing yeast strains, making sure everything's tasting like they're, they're meant to taste. And then there's a whole, you know, multiple laboratories in the building where everyone's like pipetting and they're centrifuging and they're doing all the cool science stuff that I don't have any knowledge of, but it's so important. And everyone there is so nice and a lot of craft breweries here in, uh, locally use Omega. So if you're interested, their website is very good. You can email them, you can stop in, tell them that Maplewood sent you. Uh, they also have a karaoke room, but I think that's just for industry folks. So forget I said that too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I know I know we have two more, two more beers, right? Yes. Um, but two quick questions from, from me, uh, did the street Maplewood come first or the name Maplewood? Like what, what happened there? For sure. So, um, it is a funny story. Uh, we don't talk about it much. Um, but initially In Maplewood had a, yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> it's like after dark. Um, so Maplewood had a different name when we initially started up. Uh, we started brewing beers under a different name. I don't know if I can like legally say it or not, um, but uh, I'll just say it. So we were called, <laughs> I don't know, secret name. Uh, we were called Mercenary Brewing uh, initially. So still have the M, still have the same kind of like, um, uh, you know, design kind of uh, vibe. Uh, but there's another brewery in Colorado called Odell's that has a Mercenary IPA. That's their flagship. And they didn't like that. So they sent us a letter saying, please change your name because we already have a beer called that. Even though we didn't name our beer Mercenary, it was the brewery's name. So I feel like we should have come to some type of, you know, conclusion. But instead, we decided to rename it Maplewood. We're on Maplewood. And Maplewood, the kind of smaller sect of Logan Square, has a lot of history, too. And I do agree. I also like Maplewood better than Mercenary. <laughs> okay, <laughs> second question for nature enthusiasts who might want to bike or run around Chicago. Um, it's obviously really easy to find Maplewood when you're running, but if I bring my really fancy road bike that I don't want to part with, is there a bike rack outside where I can put it and like keep my eyes on it at all times? Absolutely. There is a bike rack right outside on the patio. You can sit next to your bike and drink your beer cocktail. So there's tables outside as well. I don't have to they go in. Are. 
<laughs> yes, we have uh, it's bar service only. So you want to come in and order your drink. You can take it outside and sit out there and enjoy the weather. We butt up right next to the Metro tracks and the highway. So you're going to hear some train noise when you're out Chicago. there. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Every time we give a tour in person here, if we have the garage door up, we kind of have to pause for the train and then continue <laughs> again. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for indulging my questions. Yes. We have two more. I'll be quick. Uh, so we're going to uh, uh, switch to the dark stuff now. This is going to be our fat pug oatmeal milk stout. Fat pug oatmeal milk stout. And I missed your question. What was that question? Um, are all of these beers available to drink outside at your facility? Yes. Yes, they are. You can find them actually out and about at retailers, at bars, at restaurants. Um, and you can buy them to go here at the brewery. Um, and then you can definitely, uh, yeah, definitely find them out and about. You can also buy so, a new little glass like that at the brewery. Yes, it's our little taster glass. We have no, merch and swag and stickers. And we just started doing full-blown in-person brewery tours. They're every Tuesday. You sign up on our website. I give the tours so you can see me again. And uh, we taste through some walk around, talk about it. And we also have a monthly spirits tour. So it's spirits focused. Uh, talk about the distillation process, uh, uh, sample out some of our spirits. And that's every first Monday of the month, starting in October. So in a couple of weeks, we'll have that on Monday, October 4th. So Fat Pug is named after our mascot. His name is Otto. He's Adam C. Slack's dog. Uh, and he is not really fat anymore. We put him on a diet, but initially, uh, you know how pugs are. They get a little, you know, they'll get a little chonky. So this is kind of an ode to him. It's an oatmeal milk stout, um, but dark beer does not mean more alcohol. You can make a light dark beer. Uh, for example, this stout is only 5.9%. So it's lighter than the pale ales, you guys. Um, it does have the oatmeal in there. So oatmeal milk stout, it's going to be smooth. So oats makes everything smooth. So the roastiness I mentioned before, definitely on the nose of Fat Pug. Yeah, that's a good stout. It doesn't linger so much. You're really going to get the roastiness on it. It's light. And you can actually use this in a lot of different ways. I Baked with this beer, brownies, cookies, cakes, add a little bit chili. Yes, great addition on the chili because that kind of like it. almost chili. Yeah, right. Well, almost that that kind of chocolatey vibe really adds that sweetness and kind of balances with the savory in there. Ooh, so good. That's fat fun. Yum. Okay, last but not least. Our second dark beer, and we don't make a ton of dark beers here at Maplewood, but the ones that we have are pretty standby. Uh, the last in our tasting is going to be Brownie Points. It is a brown ale with vanilla. Can't find a lot of brown ales out and about these days. And it is a seasonal. So in our switch from summer to fall, uh, we will be having Brownie Points by our side. And don't be scared by the vanilla. Some people are like, ooh, vanilla. And some people are like, uh, vanilla. It's only a hint. And it's going to mostly be not so much in the aroma, but a little bit in the taste. Um, like the stout, the brown ale definitely has those darker malts. Not going to be as dark as the fat pug. It's going to have that brown hue to it. Really nice head on it. Mm. And it's just gonna be smooth again. We're looking for smoothness really throughout. We don't wanna polarize your palate on these. Ooh, nice. And this is 5.7%. So all the beers we tried today, under six and a half percent, they're really kind of gonna, you know, get you going. Um, Brownie Points is a brown ale, brown ale with vanilla. Brown ale with vanilla, yeah. 
Another brown ale that people are uh, maybe familiar with is Newcastle, right? Newcastle only has that brown ale that they do. Um, and you can find, let's see, um, Surly makes Bender, that's their brown ale. So you can definitely find some more craft browns out there, but um, a style that really, it's hard to really innovate on a brown ale, like, um, like pails, you really can. <laughs> Thanks, June. <laughs> Now it's funny. So the name Brownie Points, I just learned this the other day. So if you look on the can, there's like a little guy on it with like a little pointy hat with like a little pipe coming out of his face. It looks like an elf. I gotta be honest. It does look like an elf. I gnome? thought it was a gnome. Um, but a brownie is actually part of Scottish folklore. So it's similar to like a goblin or like a like a like almost like a little hobbit. So the, the story goes, um, if you leave treats out for the brownie in your house, he'll clean your house and you have to treat him really well. Amazing. And if you, right, if you offend them, if they get mad at you, then they'll like, you know, you know, rearrange your furniture and they'll like play pranks on you, but they're super elusive and you never see them. Uh, so <laughs> that's what a brownie is. Um, but also hand in hand with brownie points, of course, it definitely makes sense. <laughs> um, so brownie rolls can definitely be a dessert beer. Um, it's not really um, meant to be that way initially. It's just meant to be kind of a hearty, roasty, like winter time, kind of like cozy up to the fire kind of beer. But you can totally use it again to bake with. You can make a root beer float out of a brown ale. Like definitely use your creativity with any of these beers uh, because there's definitely a lot of flavors to go off of. And I'm super excited and happy that you guys are all here to learn. And I hope you get to come visit us. Um, but I think that's my time. Yes, awesome. Thank you so much. I mean, I know we're kind of all muted, but like so many air <laughs> claps and claps and reaction <laughs> claps. Um, yes. I've Thank got uh, I've got a quick question for everyone that I'm going to put in the chat. So what's what's at least one thing that you learned or relearned <laughs> tonight um, from Christina and from this experience? It's basically my way of saying because I'm a teacher at heart. Like, what's your takeaway? What are you going to be thinking about when you think about this tomorrow? Um, Hop farmers, yes, Ruth. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna be thinking about, well, I'll put it here. And June says difference between ales and lagers. Yes, the name story, ah, you guys are good. Um, I think what I'm gonna be thinking about is the very specific math that I haven't finished about 53 <laughs> gallons and um, that dark does not equal more alcohol. I think that's a really great way of explaining a myth, a myth or a misnomer. Um, yes, Ruth, Omega yeast grower. I mean, that, that's going to be some like weird, cool code name. It's my next dog's name. Who knows what, like you've got so many things learned tonight. <laughs> oh, Ruth, Christina, are you going to be at the Saturday event and will you bring brownie points? <laughs> um, unfortunately, I have another festival to work in Valparaiso on Saturday. I know. I wish I could switch it up. I really do. But I really want to come next year. It seems like so much fun just being out in the middle of the woods, just hanging out. Like that just sounds, and you're drinking beer. Like that sounds just the epitome of a good time and a good Saturday. Um, I can tell you what we're bringing, though. I can bring up this... Uh, my little beer in the woods. Um, so we are bringing some brownie points. We are gonna have charlatan. Is it okay, Alana, that I tell them what we're bringing? Okay, Absolutely. cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we're gonna have brownie points. We're gonna have charlatan. We're gonna have our Pulaski pills. And we're also going to have juice jorts. Oh, I saw that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which mm -hmm. is um, kind of a leg off of, pun intended, juice pants which is a bigger version of Son of Juice. So think Juice Pants is the dad, Son of Juice is the son, right? A lighter version. And then Juice Jorts is kind of like, like an uncle. <laughs> They're great. It's a hazy pale ale. You guys are going to love it. 
can't wait. Just can't wait. That's all I got to say. That was amazing. I want to just like, please spread the word about Maplewood. Christina, your energy is infectious. It's amazing. And I do wish you were going to be there next Saturday. Um, but uh, I'm sure whoever's coming is going to be great. Uh, oh, yeah. But yeah, this is this is so informative. Nick. Okay. Um, I think, I think we are about time to wrap it up. Um, I, I put this thing in the chat, which is what was your favorite beer for tonight? I think that mine is definitely brownie points followed surprisingly by the Pilsner, which I don't normally tend to go with Pilsners, but either way, Christina, thank you so much. Um, it's been a really informative and fun evening. Uh, I love that you were so willing to be interactive with us and um, we can't wait to see Maplewood on Saturday. Um, if you are here for the entire virtual festival, I will see you tomorrow. We'll have a whole new guest person. Alana's gonna be here. And um, Alana, do you, as I'm gonna say, do you have the kind of like what's coming up next for us? There we go. Yes. So <laughs> tomorrow is meet and greet the animals with frog lady presentations. Um, again, really fun, really uh, family friendly. Then we've got yoga with rebel human at temperance beer company amongst the tanks. We've got another virtual tasting and behind the scenes tour with old Irving brewing company on Thursday. And then Nick will be hosting beer and nature trivia night. So if you come to all all of the other virtual events on Friday, you're going to rock the show because a lot of the questions that are going to be at trivia night are going to be taken directly from each of the virtual programs. And then of course on Saturday, we have the in-person event. Um, so tickets are still available. Um, and if you have any questions about Friends of the Forest Preserves, want to learn more about our programs, our events, you can go to fotfp.org, or if you want to know more about any of the other programs for Beer in the Woods, um, the Bitly account is BITW21. Alana, there is a quick question, which I need ah. to uh, answer. Um, and the question was, is yoga a beer tasting? And no, yeah. it's not. Yoga is still very much yoga. It just oh, okay. happens to be at Temperance uh, in this beautiful barrel area. We're so um, it's a little bit of mix and mingle. I tried to go there and get beer. And um, body turn. loving stuff uh, with beer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's promoting wellness. We want to promote Anything? health and wellness and well-being. <laughs> so without further ado, if there are no more questions. Um, thanks again to Christina. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Ruth and June. Yeah, really fun night. Thank you. And we'll see you Thank next you. time. Bye, bye. 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 We can see the all right, Alana, you want to stop recording? Yes. Okay. Thank so it you wasn't both.